Let's recite the Chola It's a farida 
meaning it's an obligation of every human being, particularly the believers. The notion that ignorance is bliss and when one is ignorant, one is innocent is a foolish statement. When one is ignorant, they may come under the guidance or they may come under the judgment of innocence, but perpetual or what we call prescribed ignorance is ignorant in itself and it's punishable. To refuse to gain knowledge is punishable by Allah's system because now I'm refusing to progress. There is one thing I didn't know and now I know. But to say I don't want to know is a punishable act. So it is essential for us that we struggle to constantly gain knowledge because in society, when we have intelligence, which we all have, we, when we exercise this intelligence, by the way, the first thing Allah created before he created this universe was intelligence, aql. The first thing he did was he created aql. He, he guided aql and told aql to obey, and aql obeyed. And Allah loves aql, this intelligence. And therefore Allah gave it to all his creatures, and particularly you and I. We are one of the best. We created man in the best of forms. And we have indeed been honored. Allah has honored Bani Adam. That honor to the extent that even when Adam was receiving his soul and spirit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angelic beings who do not deviate from Allah, who are the highest creations, to bow to this creation. That's how much honor you and I have. That even the angels were wondering why, when this same creature will cause bloodshed and will disobey you and will cause harm and destruction, why? Allah replies, in the alam mala I know that which you don't know. This potential that you and I have must be exercised, must be taken to its fullest potentials as long as we're breathing and we're alive. And if we as a society, just imagine for a moment, we all indulge in the acquisition of knowledge, in the splitting of knowledge, as as our fifth Imam is known as Baqir al Ulum, Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wa salam, meaning one who split knowledge. Salawat al Ulum. Honestly, if the society were to indulge in the acquisition of knowledge sincerely, this world would be paradise. This world would be a wonderful place to live. There'd be no destruction, there'd be no killing. We would not have to put locks on our doors. We don't put locks because the lions are going to come in. We put locks because other human beings will come in. We, we hide wealth because other human beings will steal it. Well, who are the ones who will steal? Who are the ones who will encroach? Who are the ones who will take other people's rights? The ignorant ones. Jahil, the one who rejects the Rahmah of Allah. The one who wants to turn the light off when Allah SWT gives illumination and guidance. That society is dangerous. So we as individuals, if we encourage ourselves and those around us to constantly indulge in good conversations and to learn and to teach, then we would have minimized destruction in society, for sure. As they say, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. It's the most expensive thing is ignorance. Right? So our obligation is to split knowledge. And when we come to these kinds of gatherings, we should ask ourselves, when I leave this facility or these kinds of gatherings, have I learned one more thing that will take me closer to the truth, closer to Allah, closer to submission, closer to humility, closer to that peace and tranquility of my heart in my heart so that I have achieved my existence in this world? It's very important. And our blessed Imams have stated, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib has stated, There are three kinds of people in this world. The learned, who are the teachers. The learners, who are the students. And then the waste, the rubbish, trash. Three kinds of people are in this world, you know that? There are only three kinds. The one who's learning is teaching. The one who's a student who's learning. And the one who's useless, hopeless, trash. So you and I have to say, and by the way, the first two, are not exclusionary, they are constant, both together. That while I'm teaching, I'm learning, and while I'm learning, I'm teaching. It's impossible to be exclusive. Even the Messenger of Allah, who was our teacher, was learning. Imam Ali was teaching us, he was learning. And while I'm learning, I naturally become a teacher, because my knowledge now 
exudes in everything else. And that becomes a progressive society. So we are only, there are only three kinds of people. Daily when I should ask ourselves, God forbid I'm the third one. God forbid I'm the third group. The one who's wasting time in rubbish talk. The one who's wasting time in mundane, foolish talk. One who's busy creating mischief in society. The one who talks about mundane things only to be destructive, not to be constructive. Or, for example, fault finding. People who sit around looking for everybody's fault. You see? Allah says, do not find faults in each other. This is in Surah Hujurat, the 49th chapter. Allah says, don't find faults in each other. You find people have this energy constantly looking for faults in everyone else because they themselves lack so much desire to progress. The only thing they want to make everybody is to regress so that they may appear progressive. Because there's another way to appear progressive is by making everybody regressive. Rather than promoting progression and promoting myself in progression, they are busy regressing everybody so that they may appear transiently to be progressive. That's the kind of foolish talk we must avoid. Because if we indulge in it, trust me, no one is fooling themselves but ourselves. And you know, nothing is more repulsive to the self than to be lied to. If you ever want to understand the self, Nothing is more repulsive than when someone lies to us. Even a pathological liar like Muawiyah hated to be lied to. He did it all the time, but he hated to be lied to. Because Allah is showing the fitrah that as much as this one likes to lie, he doesn't like to be lied to. Because something in my fitrah says, I want to know the truth. Now when we do these kind of indulgences, which are regressive, we are lying to ourselves. We are cheating ourselves. We are regressing ourselves, but unfortunately collateral damage is that the society also struggles and is kept behind as a result of this foolishness. That's why Quran says, And don't give each other bad names after you've had faith in God calling each other bad names. There are some communities who cannot recognize you except they give you some bad name. Because it makes them feel good. In some communities, the poor guy is dead, but on his tomb is the bad name. Because you just don't know them anymore. That Allah forbids in the Quran. And Allah says, if you do not turn away from such behavior, you are an oppressor. And Allah punishes oppressors in the Quran. Allah says, anybody who oppresses shall be punished on the day of judgment. So Allah, 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 Allah. So, inshallah, through this acquisition, we will strengthen ourselves. And tonight, the Quran, as you know, has a science. And I want to express it briefly so that we kind of get a gist of the taste. You may have heard this before, but reminding is beneficial for that care in Nahatil Dhikra. Reminder, reminding is beneficial. Allah is with Al Imran. Allah says He has given us two kinds. He has revealed two. He has revealed the book to you. Some of His verses are decisive. Muhkamat, Hunna Ummul Kitab. It is the mother of the book. Wa Ukharu Mutashabihat. And what is left over are the allegorical. Allegorical meaning. They can have multiple interpretations, they have similarities in interpretation. Shabha, as we say Shabha, in the root word means something which is similar, it's an analogy, something that has similarity. Whereas Hakama, which is the root word of Muhkamat, is that. So as I was saying, with regards to two kinds of verses, Allah has given us decisive and allegorical. And that's life. Notice in my conversation, there will be things that will make sense perfectly to you when I say it, and there will be things that say, well, I think he meant that. You and I cannot avoid the decisiveness and the allegorical nature of language. It's impossible. Even a gesture may imply something to you, may imply something entirely different to someone else. That power of implication, based on subjective translation that we give, is healthy. It brings diversity in society. It brings diversity in thought. So Allah did not want to make us monolithic. Allah said, We made you but one self. 
But you notice every one of us in this room and on earth, 7.4, 7.5 billion people on earth, every one of us is unique. No two people on earth agree on everything. Not even a child of its own mother, not even identical twins or genetically identical agree on everything. Why is that? Because diversity is the spice to life. Having a difference of opinion is healthy. It's what brings momentum and movement. A monolithic society that thinks one way, one track, one thought, is a dull, dead society. You will notice that what makes Islam so powerful is its power to be inclusionary, not exclusionary. It's power to take the whole society in a pluralistic society and to say you are all of different faith, maybe, maybe of one faith, but you all come under the umbrella of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the nature of the Quran. Quran, its spirit, its driving force, is its power of that inclusion. Inna ladina amru wa ladina haadu wa nasara wa sabi'in man amana billahi wa liyawla wa amila sa'alim. See? فَلَوْ عَجْمُ إِنَّ رَبِّهُ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَوْ يَحْزَنُونَ Indeed, the believers, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, you believe in one God and do good deeds, for you there is no fear. Don't worry about it. لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ See, universal, it's inclusionary. So you notice that this diversity of opinion is healthy as long as there is sincerity in the approach and there is collectiveness to reach decisiveness. So here's one example that I'll give, and I'll describe this ayah with the limited time I have. Technically, the entire Quran is decisive. It's mahkam. The entire Quran is mahkam. It's not allegorical. But it's allegorical depending on my approach. The more ignorant I am, there are allegories that will not make sense to me. The closer I get to Allah, the more compact my thinking becomes and it becomes holistic and I start to see the entire Quran as one. And I see it as a decisive book. Let me, let me give you an analogy. We have 99 names. Allah has the best names. You believe 99 names, actually there are more than 99, but the best names are 99. Imam Ali Salam says that if you consider it, the Asma al Husna to be separate from each other, you have done shirk. Yeah. Meaning, if you compartmentalize Allah into 99 compartments and say, This is the part of God's mercy, this is the part of God's you know, mightiness, this is the part of God's wisdom, you have compartmentalized, you have done shirk. You have associated partnership with Allah. You cannot do that. So, but 99 names, the 99 names, I can only process one at a time, who are Rahman al-Rahim, al-Malik, al-Quddus, al-Aziz, al-Hakim. I'm, I'm processing one at a time. Yes, because I'm ignorant. But the more I indulge in feeling the presence of Allah, as Allah al-Mizan in Tafsir al-Quran mentions, he says that you will take the 99 names and make them fana. You will destroy them. How do you destroy them? He says you will merge them as one. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, the best example you can give of Allah is Allahu. La ilaha illahu. Allah is He. There is no God but He. That Allahu is com completely condensed into that one thought of all the 99 qualities in one shot spirit. You feel the presence of God, you feel His mightiness, you feel His justice, you feel His mercy, you feel His wisdom, you feel His uh, omnipotence, omniscience, every. Thought instantaneously hits you. Say, but that's very difficult. Precisely. But that comes to struggle and realizing about Allah. As Imam Ali Aslam says, and by the way, anything I say, Imam Ali Aslam says, please understand that's what the Prophet is saying. He said, I see nothing but Allah. Everywhere I look, I see Allah. I, he even says, he says, I don't worship a God unless I see him. What do you mean? to see God. He says, eyes don't see him, but hearts see him. And I see nothing but God. Meaning every insect crawling, human being, you see the rahmah of Allah. For the barakallah, ahsan al khaliqeen. See, I see a person says, the mind is saying, you see that being, he's looking at you, he's blinking, that's only because of Allah. Allah is sustaining that person. He's talking to you, that breath that he's taking, even that breeze that's hitting your face right now, is purely because of Allah. You feel nothing but the presence of Allah, that is what you and I need to achieve if you're going to get close to Allah. This month of dhikr, this fasting, is precisely designed to help us achieve this.
focal point to come to a point of thought, not fragmented thoughts one at a time, because the minute I fragment, I'll start to do injustice. For example, I'll say, God is so merciful. And all I think about is his hafoor. He's so hafoor, Rahim. He's so merciful. My God, I've been thinking about his, his forgiveness, his power of forgiveness. And, it, and I don't think about others. Then I start committing haram. I say, brother, why are you doing haram? You're drinking. It's okay. I'm thinking, but it's very forgiving. He's infinitely forgiving. So no matter what I do, God will forgive me. See the danger of compartmentalization? You start thinking of one thing, you forgot the other part. If you start focusing on one part, you have done injustice. It's like if I look at you and I only focus on one part of you and not the holistic you, I will do injustice to the person. It's not a clear vision of who you are. You have to see the person holistically to appreciate the individual holistically. It's all about the holistic nature of approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having said that, this Quran is the same. It's a holistic book. It has all the guidances in it. See? Everything in the Quran has been described. We have struck every kind of example in this book. It's a holistic book. Well, what does it mean by that? We will discuss it, but let's describe it. Two kinds of verses. Mahkam Ummul Kitab. Now, what is Ummul Kitab? Why is the word Um used? Because it guides, it protects, it's the originator, it's the source. Like a child. When a child wanders away, it feels most comfortable when it comes back to its mother. Ummul Kitab. Mother of the book. So the verses of the Quran, you notice that the driving force of the Quran are the muhkamat verses. For example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It's muhkam. You see? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Blessed is he. The, 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 uh, merciful, the beneficent, the merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You see? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. It's muhkam. It's very difficult to shift the uh, descriptions of this. It hits you very quickly. Then, Quran says the other, the remaining verses are known as mutashabihat, allegorical. And they can be interpreted in many ways. And here's what the Quran says. Then as for those in whose hearts is corruption, meaning perversity. People who want to take the law of Allah and play with it. They don't want to submit to Allah. So they go to the Quran and take a verse and mistranslate it without proper context and use it as a, as a, as a means to misguide people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They take these verses to create fitna, meaning to create trials, to confuse mankind. And they give it their own interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Now we'll describe who are the rasikhun of the ilm. And the Quran is saying, listen to what they're saying now. The rasikhun of the ilm. Rasikhun of the ilm meaning people who are deeply rooted in knowledge. The ones who have access to the secrets of Allah system. Oh, Allah. 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 They say, amanna, we believe, meaning they have total faith in the book. The entire Quran is from God. Now, if you go deep, what they are meaning is the Quran is a holistic book. The law of God is holistic, it's complete, it's not parts. And they see the Quran as a complete book, meaning the power of ta'wil now is guided. So people say now, Quran says, you know, la ya'lamu wa ma ya'lamu ta'wil ayin Allah. No one knows the ta'wil except Allah. And those deeply rooted in knowledge say we believe. Some argue, should this sentence be connected? Meaning no one knows this interpretation but Allah and those deeply rooted in knowledge. It's not wrong to say that. But in reality, you have to stop on the first part. No one knows this interpretation but Allah, 
And those deeply rooted in knowledge are taught by Allah and therefore they also know. And they say, yes, we believe in it. And they say it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the interpretation. And no one pays heed to this except those who are deeply rooted in knowledge. Meaning you have to struggle mentally, spiritually, constantly to get close to the Quran and you become, inshallah, around the Ulul Albaab. Who are the Ulul Albaab? The highest of the I remember a hadith where in the Kaaba, there were people pushing. You know, while going around, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, they were pushing. And Imam Zillah says, Alas, Alas, when did God say that they should do this? They are in the presence of God. Why are they pushing others? This is not a How did you come and circumambulate around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allahu Akbar, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika Laka Labbaik, I am answering your call, Allah says, and you're pushing others? Like this idea of going to Hajar al-Aswad, you find people push to get to touch the stone. Imam Jafar Sadiq says, he says, God did not make it marching to go touch the stone. Why are they jumping on top of each other to touch this? This is the Jahiliya I'm talking about. The ignorance, the compound ignorance is we don't know that we are harming others. That's dangerous. And inshallah I pray, especially for myself, that may Allah give me hidayah from my ignorance, because nothing, I am, I am not afraid more of anything in the world than myself. I am my worst enemy, and nothing can harm me more than my own foolishness, and my own stupidity and my ignorance. And I seek grace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God forbid that if I do something due to my own ignorance, that Allah inshallah increase our hidayah, increase our guidance. I want to touch on some very quick ones, just examples of allegorical to the decisive so we understand. On the levels of Aqeedah, the levels of pure belief. For example, Allah. I've used this example many times, but I'll repeat it. There are people in Islam who actually believe that on Judgment Day, they will actually see Allah sitting on a throne. And he has one foot in hell and one foot in heaven. And there's hadith, collections of them. You know, those who concocted these hadith after the messenger, made it into piles and piles of books. And there are all these foolish hadith that Allah SWT has a face, he has a body and his legs, astaghfirullah, and his hands. Why? Because they take verses of the Quran that are allegorical, they take them literal. For example, Tabarak al biyadihi mulk wa ala kulli shayin qadir. Blessed is he in whose hand is the authority, is the mulk, and he is almighty. So they say, see, God has hands. Tabarak al biyadihi Biyadihim, meaning hands. The, the children of Israel were saying the hands of God are tied. Allah says, my hands are not tied, yours are tied. Oh, you see Allah is using hands again. Or, The throne of Allah ascends the sky to the earth. Ah, he's got a throne, he's sitting on a chair, kursi. Mm. They take it literal. These are the ones whose minds are perverted. The perverted ones. I remember when I went to Mecca the first time to Hajj, they gave me this book of Hutut al Arira, Disputation of the, you know, the astray, meaning the laws of Anul Bayt, we quote unquote, the Shia. And they had to make it an article of faith to let the whole world know, watch out for the Shia. Right? Shia, Sunnah, just titles. There's a way in the Deen and Allah and Islam. It's the way of Haqq versus Ba'adul. All this energy being spent today to go bash unnecessarily. But anyway, I don't want to go on a, on a tangent here. But in the book, they say, they, they put two columns. And I was chuckling about it when I was in Haram. I said, SubhanAllah, look, come on ignorance. In it, they say, the Shia say, on Judgment Day, God cannot be seen. We say we will see him in the face and the body. So I said, look, who's, who's doing shirk here? <laughs> You know, we're saying we will not see it. They're saying, no, we will see it. He has a form and a shape. Now, how can come to you and say, well, how do you disprove it from the Quran? Since the Quran is a science, then how do you disprove it? How do you prove the point that God doesn't have a hand and it's an allegory? How do you prove it? You find the Quran is a way, the method by which to convince you it's wrong. The way we do it is, this is by ilm, 
is you look at the law of contradictions. When there's a contradiction, then you have to back up. It's almost like you hit a wall, you have to back up. It's the wrong way, it's contradicting. You cannot say yes and no at the same time. It's a contradiction. It's like the person who comes and asks, no, I understand. Can God, you know, without, ex without contracting the universe, put it in an egg? Imam says it's a contradictory question. Throw it out, it's foolish. It's a contradiction, it's a foolish statement. It's like can God kill himself. It's a foolish statement. Allah is all living, and the notion of killing is outside of his jurisdiction. So it's a foolish, contradictory question. It's outside of the, what we call, the, the set of questions possible. Like a human being, you know, swimming with the fish, like the fish, so it's, what do you mean by it? It must be an allegory, because you're not fish. If you have a contradiction, you have to back up. So now they say Allah has feet. And Allah has hands. But if you go to Surah Rahman, Surah Rahman, Allah says, Kullu man alayha fa. Now basically, we know that Allah is ever living. Because Quran says it. He always was, always will be. He was not born. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Right? And Allah Subhanahu Allah is independent, and nothing destroys him. He is. He does not suffer from any perishing states. Quran states that, and everybody, even those who believe in Allah, have the body is suffering Allah, say this. And when they say this, Allah it means that his body is so unique; it's not like ours. Astaghfirullah. How do you describe it? In Surah Rahman, Allah says, "Kullu man alayha fan, wa yabqa wajhu Rabbika al Jalal wal Ikram." Everything will perish, but the face of God will remain. Now the Quran has created a contradiction. If you say that Allah has hands, because now his hands have perished. And his legs have perished, because everything will perish but his face. And that's a contradiction in the Tawheed of Allah. So the Quran now, the muhkam, kullu man alayha fan, wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dal jalal, again has become a decisive verse for the allegorical, and it corrects it and tells you, don't interpret it this way. God is not the one who has legs or feet or face. Do not even bring it in that arena. Do you understand that? Salat ala Muhammad Muhammad. Now you will notice that our differences in schools of thought today are all hinging on the mutashabihat. And typically mutashabihat are events that will happen in the future. For example, what will happen in paradise? What will happen in hell? We don't know exactly. Quran describes hell, Quran describes paradise, describes the rivers, describes the milk, describes couches and elevations and pearly eyes. But these are allegories. We don't really know it because we have not experienced it. These are known as mutashabihat ayat, meaning they're allegorical. Whatever makes you feel it, it's fine. Just know it's beautiful. But the ones who have gone astray within the schools, you'll see that our major schools of thought have differed on the, on the mutashabihat. The misinterpretation, for example, and I'll introduce it tonight, and then I'll end it, I'll continue with this. In verse 59 of Surah Al-Nisa, verse 59 of Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following, says, Ya amanu, very powerful. This is the axis of obedience in the Quran. When you say you're a Muslim, but some comes to says, you're a Muslim, you obey your prophet, you're an Ahlul Bayt follower, you follow the Imams. How do you know this? I had a whole group, by the way, that came in Michigan and said, I really want to challenge you on your faith, on your school of thought. I said, no problem. He says, only Quranically. I said, only Quranically. Now bear in mind, hadith is extremely essential too, but the hadith is dependent on the Quran. That even when we hear a hadith, and if the hadith contradicts the Quran, that hadith must be put aside. And if it suddenly contradicts the Quran and we have proven that it's contradicting the Quran, the messenger says, take it and throw it on the wall because reject it vociferously because it's an enemy to Allah. Though it is attributed to us, 
it is never attributed to us because the walking, talking, living Quran is the Prophet of the Ahlul Bayt. And they can never contradict the Quran. So whatever hadith contradicts the Quran is a manufactured hadith. So that's the commandment. What is the command? Someone asked me, what is your access with your faith? Allah says, Oh, you believe, Ya Yuladina Amanu, Atiullah wa Atiul Rasul wa Ulila Minkum. Oh, you believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those vested with authority from among you. It's plural and it's present. Wa Ulila Minkum, not Minhum, Minkum. Now, somebody is here who is Ulil Amr. Now look at the beauty and the elegance of the Qur'an. It's brought in such an elegant way that you cannot challenge it. It's encoded uniquely, but you and I have to talk about it to decode it. Why? Because Allah loves when we indulge in reflective thinking. That's why allegories are used, by the way. Qur'an uses allegories as a trial. Allah is checking you and me. How are you going to interpret that verse? To suit your whims or to suit me? See, that's why it's allegorical. So here's an example, another example. Ya yaladina amanu atiullah wa atiul rasul wa ulila minkum. Now there's a third group here, now transit. All you believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those vested with authority from among you. The key is there, is, there are two ends in it, wa. Wa in Arabic means and. And as you know in logic, the more and you put in a sentence, the more restricted the results become. You can say, I eat this, or I eat this, or I eat this. You've opened up my result. I eat this, and this, and this only at the same time. Then the result has been restricted. So who is that third group vested with authority? He must say, oh, the king of the time. Can it be? No. Well, let's see. If it's the king of the time, then the king has to be in accordance with the first two. Because there's a wa there. That means the king has to be exactly in motion and in transaction and in iman as the Prophet, who is now completely obedient with Allah. And that is impossible. So then who is it? Because if it's the king of the time, then can you tell me that in America I would have to follow Allah? Because he's the authority. Does that make sense? Or do I follow the king if I'm in Jazeera the Arab? Then I follow king, the king of the, that state? Kingdom of Saudi occupied Arabia? Do I follow that king? This is the violation of the verse. Then who do I do? And he says, Holy Lord, I mean, come. It's present now. It wasn't past, it's now. This is the proof that the living Imam is with us just in this one ayah. Now, minkum, now, who's now? Who's my holy number now? Now people ask, how about the maraji? The maraji, you know, I told of Sistani, I told of Hamanai, you know, all the maraji, the grand maraji. Do we, are they the holy lamb? No, they're under the holy lamb. They're not the holy lamb. They're under the holy lamb. They have to obey the sakalain just like the prophet said. They are the best in the ummah among the ulama that we should follow as reflections of these people. But the ultimate reflectors, the infallible beings, are these. Now, look at the verse again. Ya yuladina amanu atiyullah wa atiyur rasul wa ulila minkum. Notice the word ita'at is used twice. Not three times. It's used twice. Obey Allah and obey the messenger and those vested with authority. The third group, itaat, is with the second. That means the Quran is saying the Prophet must appoint the third group. You and I can't appoint it. And this ayah, itaat, is unconditional. There is no exception to the rule. That means you have to obey. There is no room for conditions. Like if the Prophet asks you to do something wrong, don't obey him. There is no verse in the Quran like that. The Prophet is greater right of the believers than they have over themselves. But our parents, we are commanded to be kind to them, but conditionally. You see? When our parents, when they ask us to do anything, if your parents ask you to worship anyone other than Allah, don't obey them. 
Quran says that. What the Mir Sadina man anaba ilayh. Follow those who are in the path of Allah. It's conditional. We must respect our parents. But if our parents ask us to do haram things, we must not obey them. But here, there is no condition. It's fixed. And you cannot escape it. And the question is, who is the ulilami? I just give you a quick example. I had a brother who came from Tennessee, he drove all the way to Maryland. He said, I've come to challenge you. I listen to your lectures, I like you, brother. But I want to challenge you on this idea of you following the Ahl Bayt. He says, I have learned all your four books of hadith. I'm an expert in it. I said, mashallah. So you will definitely put you know, me in spin. So he says, uh, he says, why do you follow Ahl Bayt? I said, okay, verse 59, Surah so Nisa, since you're an expert in Arabic, who is the Ulil Amr? And Allah is my witness for a good 30 seconds is staring at me. He says, you know the Quran well. Who is the Ulil Amr? Tell me, please. Because you know, the minute you give me anybody, you're trapped. <laughs> he says, I acquiesce, I submit, you're right. I said, you draw all the way from the Subhanallah. I just asked you one question. He says, then who is the Ulil Amr? I says, go to verse, so to my verse 55. The Wali, who is your Wali? Your master is Allah, the Prophet, and the one who gave zakat in the state of Ruku. That's your Wali, the one you're going to follow. The word here, Wali, in Arabic, is Mufrad. It's not awliyakum Allah. Inna ma waliyukum Allah. Your master is Allah, the Prophet, and the one who gives zakat in the state of Ruku. Meaning they're all one in one mission. Here, the Ulil Amr minkum is none other than the chosen ones. Allah is chosen, which the Prophet starts with. He says, Man kum tu mawla. Fahada alihdu mawla. Salatullah wa And if you have any dispute, any question, go back to Allah and the Messenger. Wow. Could you and I get more clarity in the Quran that if you have any dispute in legal matters and in matters as to who is the only Amr, then you have to ask Allah and the Prophet, not the people. See, why is that the case? Because historically, principally, Allah's guidance system is only from Him. Who can intercede on behalf of Allah except by His permission? He knows what is in front of them and what is behind them. So that guidance system is critical. Why? If our guidance goes out of focus, Shaitan sits on that chair. And the minute Shaitan sits, havoc starts. Today, I was reading the news. This ISIS group now is going around recruiting young British children. And they are such extremists. They are such extremists that to them, to establish the Khilafah, they need to wear an island people. This is the religion, the so-called religion of peace. That we're going to wipe out the population, so we establish peace. What a contradiction. This is not the system of prophets. This is not the system of the Quran. I give us news in the Quran. Nobody was endowed with more authority than prophets on earth. This notion of people thinking they can call, hold guns and say, Allah, Allah, I shoot you for the sake of God, is nonsense. This is haram. This is not Islam. Never are you and I allowed to shoot anybody unless shot at first and even then try to avoid it. Give me an example. The Quran speaks of the most treacherous example is Pharaoh. One of the most treacherous, arrogant examples in the Quran is Pharaoh. Now Pharaoh was a murderer, was a thief, he was fooling people, he was arrogant, he called himself God, and he readily killed at will. So you couldn't find a more treacherous example of a person in the Quran as a role model of what you and I should never be. On the opposite, you have a prophet who is raised in the very house of this righteous man as a sign of Allah that if you're going to be arrogant, you will raise him. 
and then he will come and bring you down. That's the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be arrogant. I will bring somebody in your house and bring you down. That's what happens. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending Musa, Ya Musa, idhab ila Fir'aun, innahu ta'ala. This is why I love the Quran. When I read the Quran, no way do I see God has given me the authority. Take the gun, go shoot the guy who doesn't like me. Shoot the one who doesn't believe in me. The one who's an atheist, go kill him. The one who's a polytheist, go shoot him. Go burn him. Where? Where does the Quran say that? Nowhere does the message, even when the Christians came, Allah said to the Prophet, if they don't believe you, you tell them I bear witness that I'm a Muslim. And tell them I'm a warner and walk away from them. Never did Allah say, grab them, kill them, destroy them because they're Christian. Never. This is ignorance of society today. Misinterpretation where leadership has come in the wrong hands and there are people now fanning this, this banner of so-called Islam at the cost of destruction for humanity, at the cost of taking people away from the deen, at the cost of taking people away from submission. When Musa is being told, go, he said, Rabbi Shahri Sadri wa Sirli Amri wa Hul Uqtata min Lisani Yafqa wa Khawmi wa Jaali wa Zira min Ahli Harun Ahi. They expand my chest, loosen my tongue, and take, give me my brother. Look, look what Musa is saying. Listen, Musa is Rasul and Nabi. Musa is Rasul and Nabi. He's one of the most mentioned prophets in the Quran. Musa is. He doesn't say, God, you've appointed me with this mission. Thank you. Uh, Harun, come with me. I choose you. Come. He doesn't do that. So, Ja'ali Wazir Make my brother my helper. Musa is a prophet. He's chosen. He's already been assigned with the mission. Even then, he doesn't choose somebody to help him. So, imagine we choose leaders under that protection. Impossible. Only Allah chooses. And Allah chooses Harun as his brother. Says, I choose Harun to join you. Why does Moses just choose? Even a prophet cannot choose unless it's by the will of Allah But here's the critical point. That when Musa is going, Allah says to him, When you talk to Fir'aun, use a soft tongue. Lest he becomes inclined to me. This is Islam, my brothers and sisters. Kind speech and forgiveness is better than charity followed by injury. Quran says, look, a prophet of God is not told, Musa, take this stick, the one that turns into a snake, strike it on the neck of Pharaoh and behead him. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say, let it turn into a snake and he will bite him and he will die instantaneously. No such mention. Speak to him with a soft tongue and leave him alone. This is Islam. This notion of people going around thinking that their leaders have given them this authority to hold guns and to go kill people indiscriminately with impunity is haram in Islam. There is no such thing in Islam and they have fabricated another religion that has nothing to do with the spirit of the Quran. May Allah protect us and may Allah give us the tawfiq and the wisdom through good guidance of Allah, I mean, uh, Allah, Rasulullah, that we maintain this order so that our guidance system is perfect. So that we are not misguided, so we don't cause the, the harm that's happening today in Iraq, the harm that's happening in Syria, the harm that's happening in Palestine. Everywhere you see around the world in Afghanistan, people are dying, getting butchered, getting killed. And if you look behind it, there's some ignorant group of people who are passing judgments that are outside the prescription of the Quran. May Allah protect us from them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nalwa ilayka fi dawlati al-Kareema. Ar-Rizzu bi al-Islam wa ahla. Wa tadrilla bi al-Nifaq wa ahla. Wa taj'alna na'am fiha min al-Dua'ati na ta'atik wa qadati ila sabirik. Wa tarzukuna biha karamat al-Dunya wa al-Akhara. Wa akhara da'ani alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.